Good afternoon and welcome to the Beaks Financial Cloud Group PLC Interim Results Investor Presentation. Throughout this recorded presentation, investors will be in listener only mode. Questions are encouraged and can be submitted anytime by the Q&A tab situated in the right corner of your screen. Just simply type in your questions and press send. The company may not be in a position to answer every question it receives in the meeting itself. However, the company will review all questions submitted today and publish responses where it is appropriate to do so. Before we begin, I'd like to submit the following poll. And I'd now like to hand you over to Fraser McDonald, CFO, and Gordon MacArthur, CEO. Good afternoon to you both. Hi, folks. Thank you. Um, hi, Gordon MacArthur, CEO and founder. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, Fraser McDonald, CFO. Hi, folks. So I, I'm going to kick off the presentation, um, just kind of review the first half uh, of the year. Um, Fraser will take over towards the uh, the late, latter few slides to uh, go through the financials. So, um, so I think uh, our first half, which is uh, end of December, um, was a was a good period for us. Kind of record revenue growth. Revenue was up forty six percent. Monthly recurring revenue end of December, just shy of sixty million um, committed uh, annual revenue. And then EBITDA was up 41% um, to 2.4 million. Um, I think you've, you've probably seen that we've made a number of announcements since the um, we finished our first half. So some of the figures have, have kind of grown substantially um, since the end of December to, to today's date. Um, so just a, a quick bit about the business. So Beaks is a, a cloud computing um provider into the financial services arena. Um, we have been now doing this for 11 years. IPO was in 2017, um, and we f focused solely on capital markets as a, as a sector. So we provide compute, i.e. Um, compute resources, servers, virtual machines, um, connectivity. Um, we've now got around 250 plus connections to um, venues directly around the world. And for those of you that have heard us present before, you'll understand that when we talk about connectivity, that is direct fiber connections between the edge of our cloud environment into um, various exchanges, venues, um, technology providers uh, around the world uh, across our 22 data centers that we currently have. We also provide analytics um, where we acquired a company called Velocimetrics two years ago and have been gradually integrating that um, offering into our um, infrastructure as a service offerings. Um, we've got, we basically, the, the cloud is made up of what we call the three P's, so public, um, which is really the legacy part of the business. Um, that was a, as a fully shared environment where you can come in over a where you can come in using the, the company website or our company portal by uh, various flavors of infrastructure and in our data centers around the world and go onto a shared platform. I think that's the, the kind of legacy part of the business. Um, shrunk a little bit last year. Um, I think we, we've been very clear over the last few years that we've, we've been focusing on um, private and, and latterly proximity, which we'll talk about in, in more detail. So the private cloud stuff is mm -hmm. is a big part of the growth engine at the moment. It is um, bespoke cloud environments built for um, customers over multi years. Um, that has a lot, some shared services in it, but the majority of that infrastructure is dedicated to a particular client. Um, proximity cloud is the the new iteration of of um, the business and our, our um, infrastructure and service, but there's, there's some dedicated slides on that later on. So I'll talk about proximity and the latest iteration of proximity cloud, which is exchange cloud as we go through the presentation. So we cater to various sizes of organizations. You know, the focus on the business since IPO has really been tapping into that tier one marketplace, i.e. the biggest banks, brokers, exchanges, investment managers around the world. But we still have a, a lot of smaller clients, a couple of hundred um, smaller brokers, hedge fund, proprietary trading groups and technology providers. And we run low latency multicast trading environments. So multicast is the way that um, uh, market data is sent from an exchange outwards. So multicast is, means the exchange send once and it goes to all of the endpoints, all of the members of that exchange at the exact same time. This is the current um, 
map of our data center footprint around the world um, has grown substantially over the years. So I think we're in the, we're about 22 locations uh, around the world at the moment. Some of them are Equinix data centers, some are interaction digital realty, some are exchange data centers themselves. Um, and the, the black dotted line between all the data center locations is our backbone where we allow clients to send traffic between various different exchanges or venues um, all over a kind of low latency, direct point to point connectivity. Um, we are looking at some new sites We on the back of customer demand. So we have a, a client who has the, he announced earlier in the year that has uh, signed up for um, dual footprints in Washington. That's a, a big client extending out from London. Um, and along with IPC, who are one of our bigger partners, we are looking at um, deploying in Amsterdam, Geneva, Zurich, and Mexico um, in the second part of the year. So as you can see from the map, we've got fairly decent geographical coverage. Uh, Mexico give us a, a South uh, American footprint to, to start with. Um, and then, you know, we may be looking at places like Johannesburg as, as we go, but the, the map's getting fairly busy. Quite a lot of these sites grow um, and without much fanfare, really. We don't really tend to talk about it. People want to understand more about new sites and growth and existing, but, you know, London and uh, and, and New York are, are, you know, have grown exponentially over the last few years in terms of overall footprint in, in the data centres. Um, so why is it needed? Um, we we you know I, I, we exist because there is very limited cloud capability in exchange data centers. You know the, the big hyperscalers do not um, operate tend to operate in the you know the exchange data centers. They're all owned by the exchange themselves. Um, the the hyperscalers kind of live in their own data centers. Um, and we fill a gap there where people want to have a cloud model. Trading in capital markets is no different to any sector in the world. People want and are embracing cloud computing, um, and we fill that gap there. So the fact that we connect directly between the, ex between the exchanges and ourselves means it's a secure, fast um, link between our cloud offering and the exchanges. Um, uh, very location specific. So, you know, if you're wanting to trade on the CME, you tend to have to be in that data center. Um, we are specialists in our sector. You know, if, if our clients have problems, they can call or knock or 24 by seven knock up in Glasgow and, and talk to someone who will be able to understand market data issues, trade queries, uh, and understand how capital markets work. Um, we believe that Using using Beaks as a as a cloud provider is much cheaper than than building out environments themselves. So there is a as a cost cost differential as well. I've kind of covered this a, a little bit, but I'll, I'll kind of start talking about proximity as we go through here. So so yeah, I mean the, the our offering has evolved quite substantially over the last decade. So. We, as I said, we started in that, that public cloud space. Private cloud has been a, a big driver for the last three or four years. And then we launched um, Proximity Cloud um, in August of, of last year after kind of building out and, and looking at that roadmap for the previous 18 months. So Proximity Cloud is a particular product offering built to tackle the tier one space. So we've got a number of tier ones. We've we've won a number over the last few years, but you know, giving a proximity cloud was born out of some frustration and some engagements with, with tier one clients. We we kept having lots of great conversations with line of business people. Um, and then, you know, we get to security and compliance. Um, and classically all of our offerings have been hosted by in a big space. That's you know, when we take space in the data center, we deploy a cloud offering in the big space, and that's serviced and managed by our engineers, um, both um, on site and remotely. That's caused, still causes some problems for um, some of the larger organizations where they don't really want anyone to have physical access to their environments um, and it, it threw up a, a lot of security challenges. So Proximity Cloud was born out of 
um, the frustration and some of these engagements with, with some of the bigger clients. So proximity cloud really is taking an integrated rack or multiple racks of um, a Beaks cloud. So low latency network, compute resources, inbuilt analytics, and putting it all together, all fully integrated and delivering it to a customer site um, and laterally, you know, as we go forward in exchange, and we hand that over to the client. So it doesn't live in a, in a big space, it, li it lives in a client space managed by their engineers, works under their own security model. So um, we have spent the last 18 months building orchestration, integration of the stack so that it's all driven by a, a very simple user interface that the client then manages themselves. Um, Sorry, let me just jump back here. Um, so um, Proximity Cloud version one that was launched in August, September time really was a single user platform. So we have sold it so far to customers using it solely and exclusively for themselves. Um, version two Exchange Cloud is a multi-homed environment that we'll, uh, I'll talk about as we, as we go forward. Um, so yeah, as I said at the start of the, at the presentation, so you know, since the, the the half year end, we've announced quite a number of of wins. One this morning also, um, um, you know, some I think we're now four uh, announcements of, of multi year deals across both public and proximity cloud deployments. Um, we, in the back of this morning's announcement, that's has had our kind of record quarter so far. I think Q one. Um, 2021 was our biggest quarter ever. We when we signed five million dollars worth of, of contracts. I think we're just uh, about 15 million for the quarter so far. So um, real progression in terms of the size, shape, and frequency of the deals over the last um, nine months, in particular, on the back of the expanded offering that we now have that caters for um, quite a large cross sector. So proximity cloud and um, and ultimately exchange cloud. So as I say, proximity cloud version one, single user platform. We announced um, uh, ha uh, with our results that version two of the platform, which will be available in the next couple of months, has been branded as exchange cloud. So it is proximity cloud specifically tailored to the requirements of some exchanges. So uh, I think in previous presentations, we talked about working with some larger exchanges around the world, trying to fit proximity cloud into an, ex you know, an exchange's cloud strategy. Um, we, after we launched proximity cloud, um, there was a large announcement that you can find in a web search from uh, Google Cloud and CME, where um, Google have invested a billion dollars in the CME, um, and the quid pro quo was that the CME are going to move their entire infrastructure into the Google Cloud over the next 10 years. That, that includes matching engines, front office, back office, middle office. Um, the technology for you know, high-end matching in a, in a hyperscaler cloud doesn't really exist at the moment. We can't do it. Nobody can, you know, nobody really is suggesting that is fit for purpose at the moment. So that's why that's a 10-year a ten year kind of joint product development between the, the two organizations. Um, and when that first released, that was a, a bit of a scary moment. But what it's actually done is escalated quite a lot of exchanges um, ambitions to embrace the cloud and there's two parts to that there's the part that um, Google and CME are doing where you know an exchange data center has both the exchanges infrastructure in it the matching engines back office systems whatever it might be but also the larger part of what populates an exchange data center is end user infrastructure so you've got the exchange infrastructure and then end user compute market so Exchange Cloud has really been built to allow exchanges to offer cloud computing matching engines at the moment, um, you know, core matching engines. It's really for end user cloud computing. So we have been working to change 
include version one from being a single user platform to a multi-tenanted um, offering. What that So that means that we sell the um, exchange cloud to the exchanges themselves. They take delivery of it, they put it in their exchange data center, and they sell that as a service to their clients. But crucially and importantly, they can break up that exchange cloud infrastructure and segregate it across multiple clients. So ultimately, we are looking to get the exchanges to white label that service. That then allows them to sell it onto the clients. It gives them a revenue opportunity because at the moment they um, simply sell power and space and they don't have, uh, you know, that it's up to the client to then build and deploy their own infrastructure. It allows them to get clients onboarded quicker. You know, when an exchange signs a hedge fund or a prop shop or whatever it may be, you know, until that client is deployed in the data center, there's no trade flow happening and that can take months and months. So um, Exchange Cloud gives them the ability to onboard and deploy infrastructure, uh, you know, very, very quickly for multiple clients. And it also is a, a cheaper entry point, you know, putting the reason Beaks never really did um, equity data centers was because of the cost of market data, um, the cost of the, the infrastructure and the, and the big equity um, data centers. So this gives a, a lower entry point to some organizations who may not have the appetite to pay for the full rack and, and, and everything in the exchange data center. So the product we think is a couple of months away from being fully live and in the market. Um, and then we, we've been working with a number of exchanges along the way to, to get their requirements built into that first iteration of Exchange Cloud. So um, a, a really interesting marketplace for us. You know, Google invested a billion dollars in the technology with, with the CME for the, the matching engines. So it shows you some of the sizes of these footprints. And, and we believe that the end user compute market in the exchange data centers is actually bigger than the, the exchanges themselves. You know, there's more customer equipment in these exchange data centers than there are um, exchange owned stuff. So an interesting and, and exciting development. We're going to continue to develop, develop Proximity Cloud as a single user platform and then Exchange Cloud as this multi-home environment um, targeted at exchanges. Um, Fraser, do you want to pick sure. up here? Yep, sure. Uh, thanks, Gordon. Okay, so just, just looking at some of our, our key financial metrics for the, the first six months up to 31st of December versus the prior period. So as Gordon mentioned earlier, we've had, we've had record sales growth in the period, so over 46% up on, on last year, so just over 7.7 .7 million sales um, against, um, you know, 5.3 prior year. So, and, you know, the, the full year, as Gordon says as well, we've, we've now upgraded revenue forecast three times over the last number of months. Um, started the year, the analysts looked at a forecast of 15.5, we're now up to, to 19 million. Um, and again, another contract announcement this morning, as Gordon mentions, which helps underpin um, next year's sale forecast as well. So, you know, good good level of sales increase. Um, EBITDA, 41% up on, on prior year as well, which is, again, a, you know, a good performance. Um, PBT, so we're down slightly, so just under half a million against just over half a million last, last period. And that's a result of the significant investment we've made over the last 18 months. Um, where we've upgraded revenue forecasts, we've been quite honest that you know every extra penny that we we make this year, we're gonna we're gonna reinvest in the business and um, because of some of these products that we've been developing and continue to develop. So as I say, I think in terms of the full year, um, again, if you look at the the, the analyst research, um, the will be second half weighted again as we typically typically are with a, a recurring revenue profile um, profit margins that that you know that that slight hit we've had in the first period we should expect them to start coming back to sort of prior levels and um, as we deliver on some of these big contract wins that we've made over the last couple of months we expect those operating margins to start returning to, to prior levels okay just moving on to the next slide so as I said, we've 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 made quite a bit of uh, investment over the last um, twelve to eighteen months. In reality, so you know this period of investment is is over double what we what we invested last year. So 
overall investment of about four million pounds and that was helped by the equity raise we made back in april which was five million pound um, and that was really to put capacity on the ground it was put people uh, to, to build out product uh, and also you know to bear in mind some of the the, the infrastructure shortages and the, the lead times we've, we've, we've built up a bit of stock to allow us to do it to, to deploy the, the the contract wins that we've made. So I think looking at a couple of the, the, the pie charts here, so the product investment, so product investment of just over 1.3 million, and that's really been driven by staff. So we're now up to about 90 staff. Um, about a third of those now are software developers. So we've you know, built up quite a you know a very skilled team that's enabled us to de develop Proximity Cloud and also a V2 of Proximity Cloud and Exchange Cloud. So you know, headcount of 30 developers over, you know, been built up over the last kind of 18 months. In terms of the, the CapEx or the infrastructure investment, so just under three million pounds there. So, you know, we've we've built up the stock, as I said, and that, you know, that'll that'll deploy the the, the the contracts that we've signed. So three million in total, about one and a half million in, in stock. Um and that's enabled us um tier one contract growth wins and proximity cloud, we will we'll start putting those out. We also um, made a new uh, head office purchase. Um, we relocated there a couple of months ago, and again, that will enable us to, you know, to um, attract and retain staff. We were at the stage where we were we, we needed to move. We doubled our headcount, so that that, that two million pound investment uh, ultimately will pay, pay itself back over the next ten years. We're no longer paying rent, and we took down some additional debt to finance that. In terms of where we are with our debt, so we're up at four and a half million, which again is still relatively comfortable in terms of overall gearing, um, which is about one times EBITDA. Um, those who've looked at the balance sheet will see that you know we've because of the investment we, we're only about a million pounds, so we're, we're going to have to look at uh, strengthening the balance sheet. Um, you know, looking at alternative means of doing that, we've got a number of ways to do that through debt, through asset finance, and, and potential further equity raises. As we look to the second half of the of the next six months, we should expect the same sort of investment in terms of products and, and capex. But given some of these contract wins, that you know the the, the revenue, the operating cash flows, we're expecting to increase, and, and we'll look to see what we can do in terms of that um, um, refinancing and additional uh, finance opportunities. Okay, Gordon. Yeah. Thanks, Fraser. Um, yeah. So these. Um, slides are a little bit out of date given the, this morning's announcement but um as I, as I said earlier we are um i think so for the quarter we're um, just at um 15 million tcv um we've upgraded i can't accord a house broker have upgraded um our forecasts um three times i think over the the last few months um i don't really we're so close to year end now some of these deals that we've um announced this morning and, and are in the, in the pipeline will probably not contribute anything materially to this year's numbers um you know just getting the the deployments live whether it be private or proximity with some of these bigger engagements kind of takes 12 to 16 weeks so anything that we we do now is really going to be um under as underpinning next year's numbers um, I think the forecast is currently sitting about 25 million for a uh, full year next year. Um, we probably exit at around 20 million um, annually committed run rates. So, you know, the, the, the forecast for next year look, look you know, fairly comfortable as a, as a first pass. Um, Pipeline is as strong as it's ever been, um, even though we've announced a number of, of transactions recently. Um, there's there's a lot of sales activity in both the private and proximity and exchange cloud um, opportunity that we've got going forward. So um, we would expect as we go through the next few months that there'll be more uh, there'll be more deal flow. Um, and and that was the main body of the of the presentation. I mean, there's some appendices here, but I don't think there's 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 too much meaningful stuff there. But um, it might be worth kind of going through some of the Q and A that, that people have put in. If uh, 
Gordon Fraser, thank you very much for your presentation. Ladies and gentlemen, please do continue to submit your questions using the Q&A tab situated in the top right and corner of your screen. But just while Gordon and Fraser take a few moments to review those questions submitted today, I'd like to remind you that a recording of this presentation, along with a copy of the slides and the published Q&A, can be accessed via your investor dashboard. As you can see, we've received a number of questions throughout today's presentation, and thank you to all the investors for submitting those. Could I just ask you to read out the questions and give responses where it's appropriate to do so, and then I'll pick up from you both at the end. Sure. So, um, so the first question, uh, um, please update us on your outlook for the next two years and the balance sheet strength that will underpin this. Um, yeah, I mean, I think our forecast now go out, you know, kind of two full years. Um, I, I think we're showing uh, 25 and 30 revenue wise, which, which um, don't look too much of a stretch. Um, we, we have an internal uh, forecast or internal targets that are that are higher than that, as you would expect. Um, as Fraser touched on, you know we're currently looking at ways of of strengthening um, the balance sheet across different means. Um, we're also, you know, working with larger clients now and and trying to get them to do annual in advance as opposed to monthly. Um, in terms of some of these bigger deals, as as something else that we're also looking to lever to try and ease the kind of upfront cash burden of, of some of these big capex investments that we need to make to roll these um, platforms out so um, but yeah i mean the, the balance sheet does need strength and i think that's um that's fairly obvious um second question from david as the focus has moved successfully to do one clients is there a case for exiting other segments um that's a good question i think you know the kind of public cloud segment is the last number of years is is not really that strategic to us. Would we look at exiting that? I'm not sure that it's big enough for you know people to particularly warrant wanting to to buy it. It's um, it's a couple of million quid worth of turnover. Um, so no, I I I, I don't see as um, you know exiting a segment or you know we, we kind of maintain that public cloud but private proximity are are really the the growth engines behind the business. <laughs> Um, next one from Sam. The large contract known today as a private cloud client. I was expecting tier one clients to be primarily interested in proximity cloud. Do you see many tier ones interested in private cloud? Or is this a one off? Um, I, I think it's a bit of both, right? I mean, some of these um, sales cycles can take 12, 18 months, right? So, um, you know, clients, we've got a number of larger partnerships and, you know, it's private cloud and proximity. So it will just depend on each particular client engagement. Um, there's still a massive amount of growth available in the, in the private cloud segment and, and proximity as we go through the versions and build in more feature function will become, um, uh, you know, we'll, we'll sell more and more. So, um, but yeah, to answer the question, it's 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 going to be a mix of both. Still a long way to go in terms of growth and private cloud. Um, so next question from Matthew. With strong sales performance and pipeline, what do you see has been the main driver and how large and scale is a typical tier one opportunity? Um, I mean, the main driver is, is a cloud adoption. Um, you know, I think with the kind of... Um, getting over uh, the worst of the pandemic. I think there's been a lot of kind of pent up demand out there. And, you know, we've seen a number of um, transactions that have been kicking around for a, a bit of time kind of come over the line. Um, how large uh, is a typical tier one opportunity? We've covered this before, right? You know, what tends to happen with tier one organizations is they start small, you get a small project um, and, you know, you, you will be asked to deliver it. It's maybe not as, uh, as strategic. Um, no big financial institution onboards a new vendor and goes big bang and hopes it all just works. That that's just it's just not the way of um, working in financial services. So you know, and almost every occasion, we start with the the first transaction, and and I think we call that out actually a little bit in one of the the slides in the deck. Um, our first million dollar a year client is now spending about six and a half million dollars a year with us. So, you know, once you deliver um, and successfully deliver, then you tend to get, 
you know more and more opportunity within these clients um some some of the biggest banks in the world are spending a billion dollars a year on trading infrastructure so you know th there's there's massive opportunity there and um even at our our biggest kind of revenue client revenue it's it's still not what you would call a material um purchase for them um so a long way to go um next one does the lack of presence in some locations such as johannesburg johannesburg or sao paulo prevent you from winning clients based in the us or europe that need connectivity to these places um not really i don't think i mean every new data center location that we go into is on the back of customer demand right so if a, if a client for instance you know the 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 mexico one with ipc that is on the back of a client demand you know they, they want infrastructure in the us and they wanted something in south america so if if necessary for a deal and and, and we see um reason to do it then we will we will go and deploy into that area we don't we've never really had any huge incoming demand for um for brazil or south of uh, south of africa at the moment there are a couple of conversations potentially that are in, in and around south africa but um it's all based on client demand um so the uh, next one from chris who are your main competitors and what are the main limitation on beaks growth um you know, we've got, you know, we would view the hyperscalers as competitors to a certain um, degree. Um, they don't, they're not really able to support multicast data. They can't really do precision timing. They're not in the locations that matter. So, you know, they are there. They are obviously very deep pockets. We've got um, some old school what I would call it more managed service providers that we compete with they don't re not really a pure cloud play um and they can provide you infrastructure and market data and um uh, you know aggregated data and things like that but they're not really I would suggest a pure cloud play so um yeah hyperscalers and, and some of the the, the managed service providers that have been in and around our industry for for a longer period than 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 Beaks, I would be the primary competitors. I can pick the uh, the next one up, Gordon. I think there's a question from a, a David B. How long do you envisage the period of heightened investment to last? Um, again, that's it's quite a tricky one. I think maybe breaking in, into two sub subsections. I think in terms of the the product development. So, you know, we've developed version one of Prox Cloud, as Gordon says, which was launched in August. Uh, V two. Exchange Cloud expect to come out in the next couple of months, and then we're looking at a version three, sort of towards the end of the, the calendar year. I think at that point, product development should start to sort of level off, and you know we're, we've kind of built out what we need to build from that sense. And um, so you know, probably no more further investment in there or sort of maintenance and and adding bits of feature functionality. Um, so I think that answers the first part. In terms of the infrastructure investments, if you look at our, our balance sheet and our cash flows, you, you'll see that operating cash flows increase every year, but we've, we've reinvested that in the business and more each time. I think the, the main sort of difficulty to predict that is, is the size of the contract wins. So some of the, the deals and the RFPs that we are tendering for now, you know, dwarf what we've had historically. So, you know, some of these deal sizes will require, again, upfront capex investment which can be significant um proximity cloud and exchange cloud are a slightly different payback model than the traditional public and private clouds so they take about a year a year to pay back and it's bigger bigger contract wins it's it's you know it's, it's longer term commits and um, as gordon says it depends again on the customer side so you know we may look to where we can to support cash flows by getting you know a year in advance rather than sort of monthly commit that we've traditionally had so you know that'll that will we'll look to sort of balance the working capital requirements of the business by doing that but you know it's, it's difficult to predict as i say because the contract size wins in the future you know will require more investment so you know it could be more of the same if not further further investment to come all right thanks for that um so William, what IP protection do we have? We are going through and have been going through a um 
uh, a protection exercise, particularly around um, proximity cloud and um, exchange cloud. So that's an ongoing process to um, you know put some patent protection in around some of the some of the software that we've built in that space. You know, on private cloud, you know, it's it's more infrastructure, so it's it's hard. You know, it's it's harder to protect that. But um, yeah, we're going through that process at the moment. Um, Paul Hyperscaler, yes, sorry, apologies. That's um, so Hyperscaler is is a term used for the three big cloud providers, AWS, Google, and, and Azure. So the Microsoft offering. So they're, they're collectively called the Hyperscalers. Um, last one we've got, I can see from Harvey, the kit you install for clients. What is the protocol with regarding to maintenance? Um, it depends on what that is. Harvey for proximity cloud, we have we give the client a full SLA. So if something breaks, we will deliver replacements and um, uh, you know under guaranteed um, timeframes to that environment. It's uh, because it's hosted by them. Then all we can do is deliver the you know replacements or drives or whatever it might be. Um, so that's that's the SLA around that on the private cloud then. We do the maintenance. We you know we will agree um, patching, mm -hmm. upgrades, any break, fix stuff with the client directly. So it, it just depends what it is. But um, proximity delivery of, of replacement kit, but um, and, and the client really is then mostly will maintain patching and software upgrades. We can help them, but they tend not to want to, to do that on a private cloud infrastructure. It's Peaks is a responsibility to do. Um, Ariel, where do you see the market cap of the company getting to in the next few years? Do you see the company's <laughs> current share prices being undervalued? Um, I'm going to answer that and not answer that, Ariel, I'm afraid. Um, I have a view of where I think the market cap can get to, but um, it's, not, I don't know, it's not something that we put in the public domain. I mean, it's multiple times the size we are at the moment. Um, do you see the current share price as being undervalued? Um, I, I'm too biased, I think, to answer that. Um, you know, it depends how you value it, right? Is it multiples of revenue? Is it multiples of profit? You know, we've built a, what we believe is a market-leading product over the last couple of years. Um, is that particularly shown in the share price? I don't think it is at the moment. Um David, you're flagging the need for a capital raise. Can you commit to allow personal investor participation? Um, I mean, capital raise, uh, you know, equity raise will has also been looked at as with asset financing and bank debt. I'm, I'm, I'm guessing you're meaning the. I can't remember the name of the platform. So, um, I mean, yeah, it's something we should absolutely look at. I think we've got quite a retail following in terms of um, uh, our investor base. So, yes, yeah, it's, it's something something we would look at. I mean, we've got quite a lot of support from existing and new investors as well on the um, institutional side. But, yes, yeah, it's, it's something we should look at if, if we are going to do a capital raise, having a segment available for um, personal investors. Gordon, thank you very much for that. I think you actually managed to address all those questions from investors. And of course, the company will review all the questions submitted today and will publish those responses on the InvestMeet company platform. Just before redirecting investors to provide you with that feedback, which I know is particularly important to yourselves. Could I please ask you for a few closing comments, Gordon? Um, yeah, sure. So um, I, I think, as I say, you know, first half, good period since then been real escalation in the business and 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 we sit and and view the future prospects of, of beaks in, in a very positive manner the team has delivered um amazingly well and um you know we look to continue to do that so uh, a really exciting time and uh yeah we look, we look to the the future with positive um thoughts gordon fraser thank you very much for updating investors today could i please ask investors not to close the session as you'll now be automatically redirected to provide your feedback in order that the management team can better understand your views and expectations. This will only take a few moments to complete, and I'm sure will be greatly valued by the company. On behalf of the management team of Beaks Financial Cloud Group PLC, we'd like to thank you for attending today's presentation, and good afternoon to you all.